Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uveitis Grand Rounds. Uh, the topic today will be on the uh, update on the treatment of uveitic macular edema. I'd like to welcome everybody here, including the uh, resident applicants that are joining us by Zoom. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, what's new on uh, the treatment of macular edema and uveitis. This will be followed by uh, uh, presentations by uh, Akbar Shakur, Marissa Larchelle, and uh, Marcus Altman on surgical and uh, local and systemic treatment. So uveitis, uh, uveitic macular edema is a uh, major uh, problem affecting all anatomic subtypes of uveitis. It's a leading cause of visual impairment. Um, the MUST study showed us that 40% of patients do not have resolved macular edema, that is it's persistent at two years, and that 40% of patients relapse their macular edema, and that fully uh, two thirds of those patients require uh, adjunctive therapy that are on systemic treatment. So the uh, underlying principle in the treatment of uveitic macular edema is to control the information by whatever means necessary using uh, topical systemic periocular or uh, with or without immunomodulatory therapy, depending upon the uh, anatomic location, the laterality, the severity, and the diagnosis of uveitis. Um, persistence and recurrent macular edema is usually treated adjunctively with uh, topical, regional, or systemic steroids, again, depending upon laterality, with an assessment of the vitreo macular interface abnormalities and the modification of risk factors such as smoking, which are known to contribute to this complication. Our choices, uh, the, the basic choices are um, regional cort corticosteroids, periocular corticosteroids, intravitreal corticosteroids. There's the clinical impression that intravitreal corticosteroids are more effective, albeit uh, associated with greater uh, increase in intraocular pressure and cataract. Indeed, five uh, injections of intravitreal uh, triamcinolone will give you a cataract. Then, of course, there's the dexamethasone implant that has been approved, which shows efficacy in terms of inflammation and also in macular edema, but uh, is also associated with cataract formation and uh, elevation of intraocular pressure greater than uh, the uh, study that uh, led to its approval. So the POINT study was a randomized controlled trial that actually went ahead and compared these three treatment modalities with a primary outcome of the proportion of change of the central subfield thickness at eight weeks and secondary outcomes of improvement and resolution of macular edema. This is the bottom line uh, result and that, that showed that uh, while all three subgroups had a reduction in macular edema represented by a number less than one here, the periocular had less of a reduction at only about 23% as opposed to 39% for intravitreal uh, triamcinolone and 46% with dexamethasone. I think this is more easily uh, seen in this graphic representation of uh, the improvement with the intravitreal lines uh, up here, intravitreal injections up here, as opposed to periocular injections, uh, which were clearly significantly uh, and clinically uh, superior, as well as uh, in terms of resolution of macular edema, uh, with uh, the intravitreal arms being uh, superior to periocular. Um, as expected, intraocular pressure rise was greater in uh, patients with intravitreal uh, uh, treatment than periocular. So the conclusions of the point trial is that while all treatment groups improved central subfield thickness and best corrected visual acuity, intravitreal triamcinolone uh, and dexamethasone implant were superior, both in terms of reduction of, uh, of improvement and resolution of macular edema with the expected modest increase in intraocular pressure. And so based on this, uh, the conclusion is that for most patients, uh, the, an intravitreal approach may be the best initial treatment for patients with center involving uh, macular edema. So there's a problem with regional corticosteroids in that they are relatively short acting and hence less effective for uh, chronic uh, inflammation because it's associated with kind of subtle structural change each time you have a recurrence of inflammation. And of course, the cumulative risk of steroid exposure uh, with cataract, intraocular pressure elevation, and, um, and optimized with each procedure. So a sister study, uh, which was recently concluded and recently reported at the uh, uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology a few weeks ago, the MERIT trial, 
uh, looked at non-steroidal uh, alternatives for the treatment of uh, macular edema and compared it to intravitreal dexamethasone implant. So there is uh, evidence uh, in retrospective studies that anti-VEGF and methotrexate are effective in the treatment of uh, macular edema. So all these patients um, had exposure to uh, an intravitreal corticosteroid. So this is a randomized three-arm parallel design study of comparative effectiveness, the three treatment arms of a repeat dexamethasone injection versus um, methotrexate or ranibizumab. Patients were stratified to uh, either being on treatment with immun immunomodulatory therapy or not. Uh, and the follow -up at the primary outcome was at 12 weeks and then a monthly follow-up until a 24-week anniversary closeout. The primary... Um, uh, endpoint was the percent change in central, central subfield thickness uh, from baseline measured on OCT with similar secondary outcomes of a proportion of eyes with improvement or resolution of macular edema, uh, the change in best corrective visual acuity and safety outcomes chiefly related uh, to uh, intraocular pressure and uh, decrease in vision. So I just want to show you what the uh, treatment uh, schedule is. It mimics what we do in clinical practice. All patients received one of their, uh, their assigned uh, injections up front. Patients in, with, in the dexamethasone uh, were uh, required to have an injection at eight weeks if they met retreatment criteria, which virtually none of them did. Um, and then uh, methotrexate, again, was uh, uh, required if they met retreatment criteria at weeks four and eight. And ranibizumab was given three injections up front as it, as it, sim as it is similarly in clinical practice. So the uh, bottom line results here show that the dexamethasone implant was uh, superior in reducing the uh, thickness uh, and uh, statistically significant at all, at all time points and at 12 weeks uh, uh, between methotrexate and ranibizumab. So it was a 35% uh, reduction for dex, virtually nothing for uh, uh, methotrexate at 12%, and 21% for ranibizumab. I think this is also more easily appreciated in terms of improvement and resolution of macular edema, the dexamethasone implant being on top, showing that uh, it was clearly superior to the other two uh, with methotrexate really not performing very well. And the peak, peak efficacy was at about eight weeks, but still at 12 weeks, uh, there was superiority uh, shown in the dexamethasone implant. Um, oops. Changes in visual acuity, um, again, for the dexamethasone implant was the only arm that showed an improvement in uh, visual acuity at all time points um, at uh, about a line of visual uh, acuity, five letters. Uh, Methotrexate showed no improvement and there was no statistical improvement in visual acuity in ranibizumab, only about one letter. As expected, intraocular pressure uh, events were greater uh, for the DEX uh, implant with the IOP uh, elevation greater than 24, and of course, associated uh, use of intraocular pressure lowering medications. Um, intraocular pressures greater than 30 were seen infrequently in all three groups, less than 10%, uh, and a visual decrease of greater than uh, three lines was seen uh, mostly in the DEX, in the, um, sorry, methotrexate group. So the summary of the results of the MERIT trial was uh, that dexamethasone is superior uh, clinically and statistically to methotrexate and ranibizumab at 12 weeks, both with respect to the reduction in central subfield thickness, improvement and resolution of macular edema, and that only the dexamethasone implant showed a significant improvement in best corrective visual acuity at 12 weeks with about an improvement of one line. Dexamethasone uh, had a higher occurrence of IOP uh, elevation as expected, um, there, uh, and the methotrexate had a higher outcome of four of uh, loss of three lines of vision, but this was due to mostly due to macular edema, and most of those patients actually recovered when they were crossed over to uh, intravitreal steroids. So what do you do uh, when you have recalcitrant macular, macular edema uh, that doesn't, that just persists? So there are some alternatives. We know that there, we have the Redisert implant, uh, we have flucinolone acetonide insert. Uh, we have newly developed and newly approved supracroidal delivery of trimacinolone. Um, we've discussed the MERIT trial. Uh, I would also just briefly uh, 
discuss some of the conventional and biological immunomodulators, which do show a, a salutary effect on treatment of macroedema. And there is more controversy associated with the use of actual vitrectomy as a primary modus uh, of, uh, of treatment of macroedema in uveitis. So the flucinolone implant or the Resser implant is effective in treating uh, intraocular inflammation with decreased uh, inflammation and recurrence rate in the fellow eye, stabilization and visual acuity, but at a pretty high cost of cataract in 100% of fake guys and a very high percentage, up to 70% uh, of patients needing medical therapy or IOP and a pretty high rate of incisional uh, cataract surgery. In the MUST uh, follow-up study at seven years, you can see that there was a tendency for in the line in orange, which represents the patients that were implanted, to have an improvement in, in their macular edema, but this was statistically significant really only in the first six months, and this advantage was lost at about six years. Um, newly uh, approved uh, sustained released flucinolone acetonide insert, or UTIC, uh, has been developed specifically for uveitis, which shows um, <clears throat> Uh, excellent uh, anti-inflammatory uh, efficacy, um, and it is an office-based procedure uh, uh, which delivers an implant, uh, same uh, steroid flucinolone, uh, but at about a third of uh, the dose uh, of the uh, Redisert. The thing that is interesting about this study is that, uh, at least in the first year of the study, 71% of the patients had resolution of their macular edema as opposed to 48% of patients with sham. So that this is a uh, office-based procedure which may be actually useful for patients with very chronic macular edema uh, that uh, require repeat intravitreal injections. A uh, kind of a novel concept uh, is the supracroidal delivery of, uh, of medications, uh, specifically of, uh, of triamcinolone developed by ClearSight Biomedical and now uh, distributed as Zypir by Bausch & Lomb. The uh, concept here is that supracroidal delivery would uh, deliver a higher amount of steroid where it needs to be uh, under the choroid RP and retina with less exposure to the anterior segment and hence maybe less exposure to uh, glaucomatous uh, and cataractous side effects. This was trialed in the peach tree trial, which was a phase three randomized controlled study in which uh, supracroidal uh, injection was delivered at, at day zero and then at, at week 12, and uh, as compared to a sham, it wasn't really a sham. Uh, they didn't receive an injection initially, but then uh, they were able to be rescued at four weeks uh, with mostly uh, per uh, periocular and intravitreal steroid. Um, it reached its primary out point, uh, end point of uh, greater than three lines of visual acuity gain in about 47% of patients. But uh, impressively, uh, since this was a study that was designed for the treatment of macroedema, it showed a robust decrease in central macular thickness as early as four weeks represented on this blue line here and was sustained uh, throughout 24 weeks uh, in the study. There is really, uh, there were very few cataract events in both arms and very few uh, problems associated with elevation intraocular pressure. Uh, there is no comparative data uh, with the fluid cinolone uh, set night insert or supercrotal delivery yet, but uh, we, We'll see, because it's in the works. So I'd just like to mention that, um, I, as you know, Humira uh, and uh, infliximab uh, anti-TNF agents are, are used in the treatment, of, and Humira is approved for the treatment of uh, uveitis, and that these agents themselves do um, uh, have a salutary effect on, the, on macular edema when, when treated. Um, and a recent publication uh, showed efficacy of TNF inhibition um, as opposed to patients treated with conventional uh, uh, DMARDs, such as uh, 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 methotrexate and Celsept, with um, a significant reduction of central uh, retinal thickness and associated um, improvement in visual acuity at one in four years, and a reduction in, in the requirement for systemic steroids. Um, I think that it's also important to note that in this study, rescue treatment was required in well over a third of the patients, so that this need for adjunctive therapy is a very real thing. The, the other thing that is not mentioned in this study, but I thought I would mention to you, is that patients that are on immunomodulatory therapy um, have about a 75% uh, reduction uh, in the need for adjunctive therapy than patients that are not on that. So uh, many of our patients um, 
are on immunomodulatory therapy. What about other immunomodulators? So we know uh, IL-6 blockade is, uh, is a new uh, modality uh, that is available to us in the form of tocilizumab or Actemra, which has been approved for, for uh, use in patients with severe refractory uh, RA and polyarticular uh, JIA, and as the neuro op people know in GCA. And case series suggest that uh, it may be very helpful and beneficial in patients with uveitic macular edema. In fact, uh, recent publications show that tocilizumab uh, improved a complete response of uveitic macular edema versus anti-TNF medications. Uh, so uh, it's nice to be able to get this medication, but it's extremely difficult to get approved uh, for this indication or for uveitis. We're working on it. Um, interferon alpha 2A ad administered systemically uh, showed, shows great promise and is quite effective in reducing uh, macular edema in patients with really chronic macular edema, but requires prolonged exposure to this medication. So they need to be on it for years. And the problem with this is that the medication is difficult to administer. It is um, associated with side effects that most patients experience, which may be treatment limiting. Finally, I'd like to mention that um, pars plantar vitrectomy probably does have a role in the management of uveitic macular edema, certainly uh, in the presence of uh, obvious vitreal macular interface abnormalities, as you see here, but also in patients with uh, recalcitrant uh, macular edema that are refractory to medical care. Um, there is obviously a wealth, uh, there are a lot of papers on there that show an improvement, but uh, I would say that the uh, um, overwhelming uh, majority in my read of the literature is that there's a partial or complete regression of macular edema in 33 to 59% of patients. And this is mostly seen in patients with intermediate type of uveitis. So in summary, uveitis, uh, uveitic macular edema is a major cause of a decreased vision. The uh, treatment principle is really treat the underlying inflammation first and then adjunctively um, for persistent and recurrent uh, macular edema with intravitreal corticosteroids We've learned that intravitreal uh, triamcinolone and dexamethasone implant are superior to, to uh, subtenon's catalog injection and that the intravitreal dexamethasone implant is uh, superior to uh, methotrexate and ranibizumab from the Merit trial. We have at our uh, uh, disposal corticosteroid implants and inserts that may provide extended uh, treatment uh, such as uh, at the UT and the Zypir, but also the Redistart implant Systemic and immunomodulatory and biological therapy themselves are salutary in uh, the treatment of macular edema and will reduce the requirement for uh, adjunctive therapy. And pars plantar vitrectomy likely has a role in the management of macular edema, although this really will require full design perspective comparative treatment. So I'd like to turn it over to Akbar, who will be discussing the surgical management of uh, intractable macular edema. Thank you. Can I do the um, presenter mode? <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Uh, thanks, Al, for a great introductory talk. Um, I'm going to be discussing one of the aspects of uh, um, uveitis management that uh, Dr. Vitali discussed. Um, 
And specifically, we're going to be talking about surgical management with implantation of depot steroids. And this is an illustrative case where we used a depot steroid implanted surgically um, in, as an adjunctive treatment uh, to immunomodulatory therapy. So this was a 17-year-old Asian girl who uh, was referred for iritis. And as is often the case when they're referred for iritis, it wasn't iritis. And um, she had floaters and loss of vision in both eyes. We had a three-year history of this and was recent, was currently actually admitted for suicidal ideation to uni. Um, she has a history of depression, anorexia. Uh, she complains of uh, anod anodonia, suicidal ideation, and auditory hallucinations. And she has a diagnosis of MDD with psychotic features. At presentation, her best corrected visual acuity was 2400, 2300. Her intraocular pressure was 1719, and she had some cell in the anterior chamber. Cell in the vitreous, two plus in both eyes with haze and cystoid macular edema seen in both eyes, as well as periphlebitis. And this is her OCT. And what, a hallmark of severe uh, cystoid macular edema is the presence of this. Um, uh, subretinal fluid in addition to the cystoid change the spaces in, in that are intraretinal. And geography showed significant um, vascular leakage with this peri uh, arteriolar clearing, this fern like pattern you see in intermediate uveitis, as well as uh, papillitis uh, seen in both eyes. So we thought this was most likely intermediate uveitis, could be inflammatory or infectious. Of course, you have to entertain retinal vasculitis. So lab workup was done, which I won't belabor, but uh, infectious and, and non-infectious etiologies were investigated, all of which were negative. So the final diagnosis was uh, intermediate uveitis, likely of the pars planitis variety with significant cystoid macular edema, vascular leakage. Ultimately, near vascularization of the snowbank was found, as well as uh, vitreous hemorrhage, which was noted later. So a slow taper of oral prednisone in consultation with the patient psychiatrist was started uh, with concurrent in initiation of steroid sparing immunomodulation. We use mycophenolate one gram twice a day. As one would almost expect, uh, her symptoms improved, but her uh, psychiatric symptoms worsened. She had uh, aggression towards peers and family with psychosis and suicidal ideation. So we very quickly decreased her prednisone to 20 milligrams daily and administered intravitreal steroids, uh, specifically the uh, Ozidex implant in both eyes. And there was complete resolution of CME. There's no steroid associated ocular hypertension, and her dose of mycophenolate was increased to uh, the maximum, which is 1500 milligrams uh, twice a day, so three grams a day. Despite being on cell sept, her visual acuity remained at 2200. Her macular edema was uh, still there, uh, but improved. This time an angiogram, angiogram showed not only uh, diffuse leakage and papillitis, but also these little um, areas of hyperfluorescence denoting uh, neovascularization, which is a feature of inflammatory disease in some cases, can be a feature of uh, peripheral non-perfusion, but can also be just a feature of uh, inflammation seen here in the later frames. This dark area of blocking here is vitreous hemorrhage. So laser was performed to the areas of retinal non-perfusion inferiorly, and we started adalimumab or Humira, and there was some improvement of CME, but not complete. Three months after starting adalimumab, she seems to be doing pretty well. Her vision was 2100, limited by uh, some macular atrophy. Her neovascularization remained, vitreous hemorrhage had resolved. 
But unfortunately, three months later, she developed dense vitreous hemorrhage in the right more than the left, and the vision decreased to 2,400 in the left and count fingers in the right. And you can see here, not only is there significant media opacity, but there's also so the right eye and the left eye, but there's also significant macular edema. So we finally decided, okay, this is a patient on significant immunosuppression on, um, on Humira and mycophenolate, maxed out, not doing well, still bleeding, uh, still has CME, so we bit the bullet and uh, decided to do not only a vitrectomy, but also adjunctively uh, a redisert implant in both eyes. And a similar, uh, the vision then stabilized to 2060 with resolution of the CME, still some, uh, some macular atrophy in both eyes. So just to talk about the redisert, uh, Dr. Vitali talked to you guys about the data, but um, as far as implantation is concerned, I had a really fast fellow, but, but uh, three millimeters posterior to the limbus, uh, an incision is performed, that's full thickness. You have to make sure you break through the septi um, in the choroid, the wound is gaped, the redisert is implanted using full thickness strut sutures. This is then uh, tied in a 311 fashion, making sure it's quite tight. And then the, uh, the trailing sutures are buried in uh, interest clearly so as to avoid uh, pointy things. <laughs> the uh, wound is then closed with uh, interrupted proline 9 suture. The conjunctiva is closed and the tenons are closed over, uh, 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 over the redisert. And then lastly, uh, the uh, trailing proline sutures are pulled and allowed to fall flush with the sclera. It's amazing what you can do in one minute and eight seconds. Um, so in summary, this is an 18 year old girl with now 18 year old in this particular time uh, with significant bilateral intermediate uveitis complicated by massive CME, vitreous hemorrhage and macular atrophy. She was unable to tolerate uh, steroid due to uh, suicidal ideation, and surgery was indicated for failure of immo immunomodulatory therapy, vitreous hemorrhage, and intractable cystoid macular edema. So intermediate uveitis can present with varying degrees of severity. Manifestations may include vitreous cell and haze, which can be vision limiting, retinal vasculitis, cystoid macular edema, in a good portion of patients. And it's probably the most common cause of irreversible vision loss uh, if there's a macular atrophy. Uveitic glaucoma and cataract uh, do occur at a fairly frequent uh, rate and optic nerve edema. Retinal non-perfusion with neovascularization in the retinal periphery and optic nerve head can, uh, with vitreous hemorrhage can be present in between six and 28% as well as other structural manifestations such as epiretinal membrane. Late findings in untreated disease include cyclotic membranes, tractional or regmatogenous retinal detachments, which are very hard to um, treat, hypotony, which is a terrible complication, and tysis. Deposteroid implants can be used as both a primary and adjunctive treatment for uveitic macular edema. Uh, and to go beyond the red assert itself, one teaching point from this particular case is that not everybody can be treated with systemic steroids. Um, psychiatric adverse effects of uh, corticosteroids are, are quite common in a meta-analysis of 935 cumulative patients. The average incidence of psychiatric side effects was 27.6% and 5.7% of those were severe and that includes um, uh, when there is uh, risk of harm to oneself or others. So uh, do bear that in mind when you treat people with systemic steroids. Uh, 
uh, there's no particular age predilection or dose dependence despite conventional wisdom. And there is a significant association with pre existing mental illness to do doctor patient psychiatrists. And there's a minimal but significant increase in risk in women. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Laura Shell. Uh, I'll answer any questions if you have any. You know, even six years later, she recurred. So we needed all of them. First one is a 32 year old woman with anterior intermediate uveitis, macular edema in the right ear. With macular edema in the right eye, 32 year old. She had a previous lab workup that was unremarkable. And her first episode of uveitis was in January, just in the right eye. Later that year, she received a subtenance Kenalog injection for vitritis and macular edema. And then she went two years without another episode until 2019. And she presented with some anterior chamber inflammation and macular edema. Again, she was administered a subtenance Kenalog injection, um, but the macular edema actually got worse. And so at this point, um, as per Dr. Vitali mentioned, the intravitreal steroids have been proven to be more effective than subtenance Kenalog. And so an Osrodex was performed, um, intravitreal dexamethasone. And we can see the OCTs of these. This was when she presented. Um, with macular edema, um, was given a subtenance Kenalog a few weeks later, and it actually had no effect or even a little bit worse. And then after the Ozerdex, it flattened out. So now it's November. It's only four months after the, the last Ozerdex, and she presents again to the triage clinic with recurrence of in anterior chamber inflammation and recurrence of macular edema. At that point, she was started on Durazol, and um, received another Ozerdex. But at this point, it's a young patient, she's phacic, um, she, it is unilateral disease, but if she's requiring an Ozerdex every four months, um, we have to think of other ways to treat this. And so we discussed several more long-term options um, as, such as immunosuppression. Um, she was a little hesitant to do that because it was unilateral disease. Uh, the uveitis itself was fairly mild and controlled with drops. It was really just the macular edema that was giving us uh, grief. And so she opted for local treatment at this time. More of her medical history included gastric sleeve surgery. So we were really trying to avoid oral prednisone in her case. Um, and so she'd had previous mild intraocular pressure rise with intravitreal steroids, but a pressure of 25, not on glaucoma drops, to me is not a complete contraindication to keep using um, intravitreal steroids. Whereas a patient with a fragile nerve, glaucoma, if they're already on max drops and the pressure goes to 25, that's a completely different story. And so um, a pressure of 25 without glaucoma drops, we think we could just potentially treat um, prophylactically or there'd be a, a good response from intraocular, lower, intraocular pressure lowering drops. And so this was after the Ozerdex. Of course, the macular edema flattened out. And we decided to use the UT, which is the long-acting fluorescent alone intravitreal implant that can be administered in clinic. Um, 
the utique was placed just one month after the Ozardex. So I didn't wait for the macular edema to recur again. I didn't wait those four months for the Ozardex to wear off. We just went ahead and implanted the utique soon after the Ozardex. And this is, um, I think, a popular technique because Utique doesn't have that sledgehammer effect that Ozardex does. It's not a big bolus of intravitreal steroids up front to get rid of the macular edema. It's sort of low and slow. And this little maintenance of, of steroids in the eye can help prevent recurrence of macular edema. Um, but we find it's, it's not quite as effective as that initial bolus of using the Ozardex. We can see the pressure increased mildly to 22 after the Ozardex injection and then up to 27 after the utique, but that was without, steroid, without glaucoma drops. Um, so COSOPT was added and the pressure normalized. So after a few months, the pressure was normal, but of course her cataract was worsening. And so she underwent cataract surgery. Um, and to date, this patient has not had a recurrence of her uveitic macular edema. She's had mild episodes of anterior chamber inflammation treated with drops, um, but the utique seems to be holding strong as far as her macular edema. Caveat to this, I looked back at my data and I have implanted 18 utique over the last few years. I think this is my only case that was like a slam dunk that after she had the utique that she had absolutely no macular edema in the, in the following three years. So um, it's not that this is absolutely representative of, of the strength of utique. I think we find that more often in patients that are requiring Ozardex, maybe every three months consistently for macular edema, if you put a utique in the eye, maybe you can stretch those Ozardex out to five months. And so it, over the course of several years, it really reduces the number of intraocular steroid injections they require. Um, but I think less commonly, it's like one utique and they never have CME again. This is a different case, a 51-year-old man that's otherwise healthy. Um, we use NGAU to abbreviate non-granulomatous anterior uveitis, um, and he was presenting with painless blurred vision in the right eye. He had previous episodes of uveitis, about one per year that had responded to topical steroids alone, a history of LASIK, and his laboratory workup was unremarkable, including HLA B27. So on his exam, his vision previously 2020 uncorrected in the right eye had dropped to 2070. And this time his anterior chamber was quiet, but it was noted in triage to have um, inflammatory cells in the vitreous as well as macular edema. So it seems like his disease has now morphed into more of an intermediate uveitis. This is his macular edema at the triage visit. He was started on prednisolone acetate six times a day. And I saw him um, a week or two later, and his vitreous inflammation had actually subsided. Um, it was mild to begin with. Some topical steroids can help with that, but his macular edema didn't budge. And so at this point, we have an otherwise quiet eye, but with persistent macular edema. And so what can we do for this patient? This is really the art of medicine. Oftentimes, there's no one right answer of how to treat uveitis. Of course, there's some wrong answers, like putting intravitreal steroids in an eye with an infection. Um, but with inflammatory CME, we have several different good options. And so um, you have to just take it case by case for a certain patients. Sometimes you get some information from the patient that may sway you one way or another, such as a phobia of needles. Um, or perhaps they were on oral steroids in the past for something else, and they just remember the side effects being intolerable. Of course, there's some more um, absolute contraindications for certain treatments, um, such as putting an Ozardex in a unicameral eye, um, or patients with really fragile glaucoma, advanced um, optic neuropathy, and a history of steroid response. We'd want to avoid periocular steroid injections, and probably Durazol. We know Durazol can be really hypertensive. And then Dr. Shakur mentioned the psychiatric side effects. And of course, for oral steroids, we have to consider um, patients with uncontrolled diabetes and the effects on, on glucose. So I have a discussion with a patient. A lot of times I lay out the options if there's not an absolute contraindication. And then oftentimes they can decide. And so this gentleman, he was um, young, fit, healthy. He said, let's try the oral steroids. I don't love the idea of, of a needle around my eye. And so we did um, a six-week course of oral prednisone. Um, it tapered off the topical steroids, and he had 20-20 vision a month later um, with, with resolution of the macular edema. But unfortunately, soon after, about a month after stopping the oral steroids, he presented again 
now with some mild intraocular inflammation in the anterior segment, but no macular edema. And so at this point, recurring soon after prednisone taper, we have to start thinking about other ways to treat this more long-term, such as potential systemic immunosuppression, which is beyond the scope of this talk. And so lastly, is macular edema the best part of my job or the bane of my existence? I think it cuts both ways. You can see a patient that's 2070 and you give them one injection or a few weeks of prednisone and they come back and you've cured them. They're the happiest patients. They're 2020. Um, but on the flip side of it, if you have a patient that presents with chronic macular edema. They don't know how long it's been there. Sometimes you put an Osrodex in or use some other um, treatment form and a month later their OCT looks perfect and their vision has not changed. And that's because there can be chronic ellipsoid zone dysfunction and loss of the um, photoreceptors from chronic macular edema. And so the picture looks better and the patient notices no, dis no difference. And so that's one of the challenges with treating macular edema. And of course, the recurrent nature of it, um, especially in patients that are on systemic immunosuppression and their uveitis is otherwise quiet, but they have to keep coming every three to four months for injections. They're like, hey doc, what's going on? I mean, you, you fixed uveitis and why do I still have to see you every three months for injections? And so um, a little bit of both, I think, is the answer to that question. So, and that's all I have. Okay, um, so hi, um, I'm gonna talk about um, sort of additional local treatment options for uveitic macular edema. Um, particularly, I'd like to focus on two cases that hopefully um, highlight and kind of emphasize some of the concepts that Dr. Vitali had, um, on, had gone over uh, with respect to some of the trials um, for local steroids, um, and hopefully you know, highlight how that kind of played out in clinical practice for two patients. Um, so the first patient is a 54-year-old gentleman with sarcoid-associated intermediate uveitis that was biopsy-proven, at least in his lung. It was diagnosed in 2000, uh, 2010. He made his way to uveitis clinic in February of 2016 um, in the setting of having chronic floaters in both eyes with redness, pain, light sensitivity. His vision was 20-30 in both eyes, and he had normal intraocular pressure. Um, this is just his Optos photo. Um, it's a little bit hard to appreciate, but just on exam, really the only thing that was notable is that he had mild vitreous cell with some vitreous haze, um, and the same thing in his left eye, so mild active intermediate uveitis um, uh, in both eyes. Um, this was his fluorescein angiogram, um, just showing that there is um, a peripheral uh, retinovascular leakage in both eyes. Uh, uh, there's hyperfluorescence of the optic nerve in both eyes, um, indicative of a, of a papillitis, and then um, let's see, and then uh, kind of more subtle is what you can appreciate. There's this um, small amount of petaloid leakage in the center of the macula in both eyes, indicative of angiographic uh, CME. Uh, but on OCT, um, this was not clinically apparent. So there was no clinical um, CME related to the active uveitis. And so the assessment for this patient is that he's a, um, he has symptomatic active intermediate uveitis with um, widespread angiographic leakage without macular edema. And so just getting to the slide that Dr. Vitali showed, um, this patient isn't sort of in the spectrum yet of clinical macular edema. And so really we're gonna focus on just treating his inflammation. And so for him, uh, we focused or started with systemic corticosteroid with oral prednisone, understanding that something like topical steroid probably would not be sufficient for an intermediate uveitis with, with uh, sort of significant involvement um, of the retinal vasculature. Um, local steroid, uh, such as periocular intravitreal steroid, probably wouldn't be the best choice with a bilateral process. 
and immunomodulatory therapy might be a little bit too aggressive um, kind of for a first time episode. And so this patient was treated with systemic corticosteroid, um, oral prednisone starting at 60 milligrams and tapering over several months. Um, he ended up coming back four months later after finishing the prednisone taper now with decreased vision in his right eye, which I'm gonna focus on. So he is now 2060 in the right eye at this time, still normal intraocular pressure, uh, but he had increased vitreous cell and a bit more vitreous haze. And what you can see on the angiogram is now there's increased um, sort of the central petaloid leakage in the right eye. Um, sort of this angiographic macular edema now corresponding to clinical, um, clinically apparent uh, central macular edema in his right eye related to active uveitis. And so this patient was actually enrolled in the point trial. Uh, remember that this was the trial um, comparing periocular um, uh, corticosteroids, so subtenons kinolog to intravitreal steroid, either Ozerdex or triamcinolone. Um, and so this patient was randomized to receive periocular steroid with STK. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of go through kind of his OCT. So he received his first SDK at the time of enrollment. And you can see that a month later, he had complete resolution of his macular edema, as well as um, good treatment and resolution of his active intermediate uveitis with the vitreous haze. And in all of his subsequent visits for the trial, uh, kind of for the full six months, he had sort of resolution or, or no um, recurrence of the macular edema and his uh, visual acuity remained um, in good range. Um, and so even after that, for the subsequent three years, he was just observed. He remained quiet, no intraocular inflammation and no macular edema. And then in January of 2019, he had a subtle recurrence, just a slight amount of sort of juxtafovial intraretinal fluid with symptomatic blurring of his vision. And because he did so well with STK the first time, he was treated again in the same way with an STK, which resolved the intraretinal fluid. Um, and then another three years later, he came in now with symptomatic blurring of vision in his left eye. So this is OCT of the other eye. He did not have any active intraocular inflammation, but he did have um, uh, increased macular edema in the, in the left eye. And so again, because this patient responded so well previously to SDKs, he was given an, uh, an SDK in the left eye, but in this case, it did not show any improvement. He actually got worse with the macular edema. And so at that point, he was switched over to receive, oh, sorry, and so this was the angiogram showing that in the left eye at that time had sort of, that, again, that active petaloid leakage um, with, with uh, papillitis um, in the left eye. Um, and so he was given an Ozerdex, and at that point had really good resolution of the macular edema uh, with improvement in vision. And so just to highlight and to go over again the results of the point trial showing that um, in general, um, the intravitreal corticosteroids uh, were significantly better than periocular steroid at improving uh, macular edema, as well as improving visual acuity related to macular edema, um, which ended up playing out for this patient's second eye, the left eye that it happened in, um, but sort of, uh, you know, in the real world. So this is sort of a recommendation. So this patient was one of those patients who had a good response initially to periocular steroid which is why it was used and was effective at least for the first several recurrences of the macular edema. So the second case um, uh, is a 73 year old woman uh, who has HLA-B27 associated anterior uveitis. She has ankylosing spondylitis. She's had prior vitrectomies and epiretinal membrane peel, cataract surgery, and she had an Ahmed valve placed in the left eye for, um, for uveitic glaucoma. She was previously on systemic immunosuppression with uh, oral methotrexate, but that was stopped due to adverse events and side effects. Um, and for, as far as her ocular presentation, her sort of active ocular issue was not really any inflammation in the left eye, but it was uh, recurrent macular edema related to prior inflammation for which she, received, she was receiving serial Ozerdex injections with good response. And so for this patient, we're sort of focused on, you know, not active uveitis, um, but recurrent um, or uh, persistent macular edema. And so this patient with a unilateral disease was receiving a regional uh, corticosteroid with Ozerdex uh, that was working with good effect. So just as an example for the left eye, uh, this was back in August of 2016, uh, the patient presented with central uh, CME in the left eye, uh, received an Ozerdex with good improvement, and then again in 2017, had recurrence of central uh, uveitic macular edema and received an Ozerdex again with a good central improvement, uh, at least uh, 
by four months later. Again, had recurrence the subsequent year in April, and at this point was actually enrolled in the merit trial, uh, which again, just to summarize, compared patients uh, uh, to, with the three different types of intravitreal treatments, so either Ozerdex, methotrexate, or anti-VEGF with ranibizumab. Um, and this patient was actually randomized to receive uh, methotrexate. And so I'll just go through kind of, she had ended up having four serial monthly injections of methotrexate. And what you can appreciate is that there really isn't much change at all in her macular edema over time. And so at that point, the patient was crossed over to receive Ozerdex. And again, had a really good response as she had previously with essentially resolution of her macular edema. And so even after the trial, the patient continued to receive intermittent, intermittent Ozerdex uh, with, with really, uh, which had good efficacy for her macular edema. Unfortunately, at, uh, in, at the end of 2019, developed endoplomitis from exposure of her Ahmed valve and the, and the Ahmed was explanted. And so then when she subsequently recurred with her macular edema several months later, the question was, is, um, how to treat this. The goal or the worry in this case was that doing another Ozerdex might induce a significant intraocular pressure um, response. And um, now that she did not have a tube in place, and so the patient uh, was decided to try maybe kind of the third arm of the merit trial, which was to do an anti-VEGF treatment. And so she received a Vastin in the left eye and actually got quite a bit worse. And so Subsequent to that was then given an Ozerdex, which she had a good response to previously, unfortunately developed a quite significant sterile endoplomitis, which was treated um, um, and was not found to be infectious in nature. It happened just a couple of days after her injection. Um, so ultimately then, given sort of the uh, numerous uh, um, issues uh, with the Ozerdex inducing sterile inflammation, um, the patient then underwent uh, a couple months later, a Redisert implant uh, with an Ahmed valve placed at the same time. She required several perioperative, um, or she required perioperative steroid as well as a couple of adjunctive periocular steroids to help control um, her CME. And then at this point now, uh, two years after that, she remains quiet without any CME. Um, but as you can see, just with the recurrences, she has some uh, distortion and, and damage to the central retina um, from these recurrent episodes of macular edema. And so I just want to highlight, this is the last slide that Dr. Vitali had to summarize. So really the first key uh, for treatment is uh, for uveitic macular edema is to treat the underlying inflammation. Um, and then after that, um, there are these adjunctive treatments. So um, the first being with our first patient kind of highlighting the results of the point trial, which is that in general, intravitreal corticosteroid with Ozerdex or Triamcin alone is more efficacious than periocular steroid for uveitic macular edema. Although again, that is just a recommendation. And so some patients can have a good response and do show significant improvement as our patient initially did. And then there's the results from the merit trial, which um, as our second patient showed that um, intravitreal uh, steroid um, tends to do significantly better than either methotrexate or anti-VEGF. And then depending on the comorbidities and other factors, and if additional treatment is needed, that there's these options for um, corticosteroid implants, such as the Redisert, which our second patient um, uh, finished with and has been doing really well with. Uh, so that's all I have, um, uh, hopefully highlighting those principles that the other three have gone over so far. Mm -hmm.